Thank you for joining us for Still Speaking, a podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. We are a United Church of Christ in Mundelein, Illinois, and an open and affirming congregation. This podcast aims to explore scripture through conversation with the purpose of discovering new insights and enhancing individual faith practices. God is still speaking, and we are all listening to discern a message for today and deepen our faith. Hello, and welcome to our fifth episode of Still Speaking. Today is about a new identity. Thank you for joining us, and wherever you are, whether you're out and about or in a quiet place, take a moment to pause and reflect, and hopefully we'll bring you some new things to think about this week as you move forward. I'm Shelley Grow, your host, and I'm with Pastor Chris. Could you tell us a little bit about this week's scripture? So this week we have the opportunity to read a whole book of the Bible, which I, I doubt has ever happened. Uh, most of us within a, a church setting just hear a short uh, selection of verses or perhaps a, a chapter of a biblical book, but today we have a, a whole letter. It's a short 25 verses. We have the letter from Paul to Philemon, and this has to do with, with a runaway slave named Onesimus and what what Paul wants uh, Philemon and, and his house church to address and the, the redemption and reconciliation of relationship there. But I just wanted to say a, a short word um, to address the situation of, of slavery that's part of this um, letter. So sadly, throughout the history of the church world, there has been um, interpretation that this letter is used to justify slavery. And in early um, 19th century America, pro-slavery advocates actually called this the Pauline mandate, that, that it was used to justify slavery. Of course, our church was part of the abolitionist movement, and, and we can say that we were um, those who spoke out against slavery, saying that it has nothing to do with a Christian lifestyle as early as, as 1845. And again, um, a, a similar statement was issued by the church again in, in 1850. So we, we can celebrate that as part of who we are as people who speak against and for the full uh, humanity of people. But nonetheless, we do need to say that this is part of who we are as the church going back in time, that, that there were scriptures like this that were used to, to demean and, and separate people from the church and, and to the horror of the 400th anniversary of slavery here in America. Thank you for that context. So the letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God, because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward Jesus Christ. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I'm appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to both you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I want to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason that he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, Welcome him back as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. 
I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about you owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. One more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping, through your prayers, to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. How would you describe this in your own words? So, um, so there's a lot, there's a lot happening underneath and we can read between the lines that, um, so in my own words, this is a letter that Paul is writing to Philemon saying, here's Onesimus. He was a slave of yours. He ran away. Um, he's come to Christ through me. And so I want you to receive him back and to cancel the debt because somehow we read between the lines here, he says it explicitly, that, that Philemon owes Paul a debt. So he's saying, put it on my account, but actually you owe me something. So let's just cancel that, uh, what you owe me, and welcome this person back into your life, not as your slave and servant, but as your brother in Christ. And P.S., I hope to get out of prison and stay with you. Got it. Where does the identity concept play out here? So I think it, it's entirely that, that Onesimus was once a servant or a slave, which um, we would say uh, my concern for those type of situations, and we know it still happens in modern day situations, when we, when we rob someone of their humanity or we treat them as a, as a thing rather than as a person, um, there's a loss of identity there. So to have a new identity might be for us to remember not that we are um, a person who does acts like just I'm only my career, or I'm only what I've gotten accomplished today, but that I always remember who I am as a beloved child of God and that identity that we have through our baptism, that we have through our relationship with the church, that our identity is who we are as a person of faith, a beloved child of God, a disciple of Christ, a member of Christ's church, brother or sister in the faith. So I think, I think from a spiritual standpoint that that's what the letter is calling us to remember um, and, and to celebrate that identity and might that identity be inspirational for how we treat others. And are there possibly, it's not just about how you yourself identify with something larger than your day-to-day immediate material world, but also how others might see you. So um, instead of just seeing somebody as a slave, but also seeing them as a child of God, potentially, you know, there are a lot of other groups, right, that we stereotype people as. Sure. I think anytime um, we approach someone in a, in a serving role, um, whether it's the, the server at our table, whether it's the person, uh, getting rid of our trash. I think any of those times that we have an opportunity to recognize someone and, and reconcile that identity as, as that of a sibling, as fellow human being, as beloved child of God, we, we can bring redemption into that moment. So I, you know, whether it's a, a small challenge of, of looking someone in the eye or smiling at them, or um, recently I've been uh, forgetting to set down my phone at certain times, you know, mm-hmm. to look someone in the eye and to thank them for their service and to recognize that what they're doing is important. But I think you you got it right on. You know, I can think about this for myself and try to have that self-confidence, but, but the ways that I do it with others or especially for us, you know, what we celebrate as church community, that this is the way that we do this together. Um, we were recently having uh, conversations about what we can do to to fight climate change and and there's no way I can what I do is is but one small drop in a bucket but if we we together can do something think of how much more lasting change we can make and and how much more improvement we can bring so how's your greek i want to <laughs> it's rusty okay so here's here's the uh the biblical deep dive that there's there's a word 
um, for compassion. So compassion is something that, that I advocate for. I think we, we've spoken about before that I usually think about it as the way that the word means to suffer with, you know, passion, the mm-hmm. passion of the Christ was through his suffering. Um, that, that beginning of the word means to do that with. So the biblical word um, for compassion is used three times in this letter. Um, but it's a really interesting Greek word. And we're, I have a, a copy of the uh, King James Version in front of you. And I want you to, to find what's, what's interesting about this word. So I, I got it marked there for you. So look at the, the first one, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So the Greek term is, is splankna. Uh, you know any Greek? I'm sure I'm butchering that. So the Greek word is, is splankna, and it originally refers to, um, to viscera, to the gut. So um, perhaps this is stereotyping, but oftentimes we think uh, women are more intuitive. Men, you know, act a bit more with our, our minds here. Um, when, when I'm preaching or, or doing some teaching, you know, we engage somebody uh, intellectually. Sometimes we appeal emotionally. But, but our faith is really something that I think resides in our gut. You know, it's something that's more intuitive, that we believe something to be true. You know, you have that that gut feeling about something, whether mm-hmm. it's it's good or bad or it's right or wrong. So the Greek word for compassion originally referred to the body parts that one would see when something's sacrificed. So the viscera, organs, um, the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys. And so the old King James translation of the plural of this word, splachna, is, is bowels. It, it quite literally... Um, the meaning of the term, the English word gut, you know, captures that sense. But it's used um, infrequently in the Old Testament, mostly to speak about the mercy of God's gracious attitude towards us. In the New Testament, um, the verb is only used a few times um, by Jesus. Um, One time he's he's speaking uh, a lesson where a, a master forgives a slave's debt out of compassion, which might be exactly what Paul was referring to or relying on in this letter. Um, In the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan acts with compassion. And when Jesus teaches about the prodigal son, that that same um, parable uses that the father's filled with compassion for his son. So Paul uses this word um, in the letter to the Philippians. Mm -hmm. You got Philippians chapter 1, verse 8 there. I do. I long for you. Go for it. Will you read it? I I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. It's not exactly a bumper sticker. <laughs> no. So so our translation that we would be reading today would say, I long for you with compassion. Okay. Okay, so read it one more time. Using that word? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it strange? I mean... <laughs> I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ, all in the compassion of Jesus Christ. So I think that should be everybody's homework. We should... We should. <laughs> inspire everyone to go home and and speak that way about right. <laughs> with love for their family and friends i i long for you with the bowels, with of, the jesus, bowels. of jesus christ <laughs> okay so in this we're in this letter the short uh 25 verse letter uh from paul to philemon we got three instances we're gonna go you got them marked again there so it's uh verses 7 12 and 20 so first um paul speaks about philemon as his own uh, heart, we what I read was heart. What what does it say there in verse seven? Um, it says, "Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother." So, so we would say, you know, my, my heart is is lifted up, right? I feel joy and love. Um, but but again, this is and in verse uh, twelve, I'm sending him back to you. Was whom it I have sent again? Thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. <laughs> so. So again, someone we care about in our terminology today, you know, they'd say that a piece of my heart, right? Yeah. Or um, so I'm sending my my heart, my love back to you. Here we have, and finally, we say that about children all the time that they, you know, it's a piece of our heart walking around outside our body. Right. But now I'll just tell Dory that she's my bowels walking around. And finally, in uh, verse twenty, I think it speaks more about refreshment. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. So so again. Uh, the translation we read today, all of these were, were heart, you know, uh, love, love stations because Paul was appealing to, to Philemon's, uh, love rather than commanding him to do something. But in, in the ancient translation, uh, 400 years ago, the King James, it, it took that Greek more literally speaking about where, where our faith resides in our gut, 
um, but this uh, viscera, the bowels, the bowels of Jesus Christ. Um, so what are your it's thoughts about this? It's amazing we don't understand the scripture better, you know, <laughs> when, when you look at it that way. That's fascinating. I think it's really interesting, though, when you talk about um, faith resides in the gut and kind of that intuition. And um, I think it was a couple episodes ago where we really spent a lot of time talking about what is faith and how does that differ from belief and that, you know, you would think of um, that gut instinct that is really a knowing or a hope that there's um, something bigger out there. You're part of something bigger. So I, I usually dismiss uh, King James just because we don't use the, the these and the thys and the thous anymore. That's mm-hmm. just not language. It, it's beautiful, poetic language, but, but that language of, of uh, compassion you know, is something that, that I wanted to highlight today. I know it's, it's weird, it's strange, maybe it made you laugh, but I, I think that compassion is the way that we change the world because we, our, our heart does break. Um, we, we have a feeling. Maybe it's more of a gut feeling. Sometimes it's heart feeling. I, I think intellectually we know that something um, right or wrong has happened, but the way that we come alongside somebody um, with compassion, and I think... Um, you know, I think it's my job to say that that's, that's the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we know out of God's compassion, Jesus came to be with us. Um, when Jesus went through his suffering and redemption for us, then he gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And some people say that's that your conscience, you know, it's that angel on your shoulder, but I think you do know that truth deep in your, in your gut, and that's the compassion that we can have for others, that we can come alongside them and we can help to, we can say this, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening, and we can try to make something right. And, and that's the hope that I have that I think is empowered through compassion. That's an amazing message to come from this letter. Um, you know, we always like to have some takeaways, some nuggets for people. There are, there are two things that are really standing out for me that seem like practical sure. things that we could do. One is just the, the notion of identity, and that's just an easy one to journal about a little bit. You know, how do we think about ourselves? How would we describe ourselves? And then, um, and then to make sure that we're tying that to how we feel in our church community um, and with our group. The other one is um, how we can show compassion for other people around us. And we'd recently had a conversation about, you know, you just never know what's going on with right. people, what they're going through or what's in their heart or mind. And um, you mentioned about, you know, whether it's a server at a restaurant or something, just making sure that you're making eye contact I personally have found that um, checkout lines at the grocery store, I'm trying to be so much more intentional because, you know, I, you're digging in your purse, you're checking your phone, you're, you know, there's a lot going on. And um, so trying to make eye contact and just talk to somebody. So I think if everybody could just, you know, intentionally bring compassion, even if it's just an eye contact or a smile or a compliment um, purposefully this week, that would be amazing. Think of all the goodwill we'd spread in the world. That sounds great. So I, I want to end with uh, just citing the scriptures that that end and begin this letter. That in in all we do, may we be people of of grace and peace. That may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for this podcast from Ivanhoe Congregational Church. We are a 19th century church. Founded in 1838, but we want to be relevant for the 21st century. This podcast is one attempt at outreach. We hope you'll join us for worship in Mundelein, Illinois on any Sunday morning at 10 a.m. where you can be part of our gathered community. We aim to offer a warm welcome and a meaningful message. We also welcome your feedback. You can find us on Facebook or visit our website at ivanhoechurch.org. That's I-V-A-N-H-O-E church.org. Blessings to you with grace and peace.